The Kuiper Belt, occasionally called the Edgeworth Kuiper Belt, is a circumstellar disk in the outer solar system, extending from the orbit of Neptune at 30 astronomical units to approximately 50 astronomical units from the Sun. It is similar to the asteroid belt, but is far larger—20 times as wide and 20 to 200 times as massive. Like the asteroid belt, it consists mainly of small bodies or remnants from when the solar system formed. While many asteroids are composed primarily of rock and metal, most Kuiper belt objects are composed largely of frozen volatiles termed ices, such as methane, ammonia and water. The Kuiper belt is home to three officially recognized dwarf planets, Pluto, Haumea and Makemake. Some of the solar system's moons, such as Neptune's Triton and Saturn's Phoebe, may have originated in the region. The Kuiper belt was named after Dutch-American astronomer Gerard Kuiper, though he did not predict its existence. In 1992, Albion was discovered, the first Kuiper Belt object KBO since Pluto and Charon. Since its discovery, the number of known KBOs has increased to over a thousand, and more than 100,000 KBOs over 100 kilometers 62 miles in diameter are thought to exist. The Kuiper Belt was initially thought to be the main repository for periodic comets, those with orbits lasting less than 200 years. Studies since the mid-1990s have shown that the belt is dynamically stable and that comet's true place of origin is the scattered disk, a dynamically active zone created by the outward motion of Neptune 4.5 billion years ago. Scattered disk objects such as Eris have extremely eccentric orbits that take them as far as 100 astronomical units from the Sun. The Kuiper belt is distinct from the theoretical Oort cloud, which is a thousand times more distant and is mostly spherical. The objects within the Kuiper belt, together with the members of the scattered disk and any potential Hills cloud or Oort cloud objects, are collectively referred to as trans-Neptunian objects TNOs. Pluto is the largest and most massive member of the Kuiper belt, and the largest and the second most massive known TNO, surpassed only by Eris in the scattered disk. Originally considered a planet, Pluto's status as part of the Kuiper belt caused it to be reclassified as a dwarf planet in 2006. It is compositionally similar to many other objects of the Kuiper belt and its orbital period is characteristic of a class of KBOs, known as platinos, that share the same 2-3 resonance with Neptune. History After the discovery of Pluto in 1930, many speculated that it might not be alone. The region now called the Kuiper Belt was hypothesized in various forms for decades. It was only in 1992 that the first direct evidence for its existence was found. The number and variety of prior speculations on the nature of the Kuiper Belt have led to continued uncertainty as to who deserves credit for first proposing it. Topic. Hypotheses The first astronomer to suggest the existence of a trans-Neptunian population was Frederick C. Leonard. Soon after Pluto's discovery by Clyde Tombaugh in 1930, Leonard pondered whether it was "...not likely that in Pluto there has come to light the first of a series of ultra-Neptunian bodies, the remaining members of which still await discovery but which are destined eventually to be detected." That same year, astronomer Armin O. Leuschner suggested that Pluto may be one of many long-period planetary objects yet to be discovered." In 1943, in the Journal of the British Astronomical Association, Kenneth Edgeworth hypothesized that, in the region beyond Neptune, the material within the primordial solar nebula was too widely spaced to condense into planets, and so rather condensed into a myriad of smaller bodies. From this he concluded that the outer region of the solar system, beyond the orbits of the planets, is occupied by a very large number of comparatively small bodies, and that, from time to time, one of their number wanders from its own sphere and appears as an occasional visitor to the inner solar system, becoming a comet. In 1951, in a paper in Astrophysics, a topical symposium, Gerard Kuiper speculated on a similar disk having formed early in the solar system's evolution, but he did not think that such a belt still existed today. Kuiper was operating on the assumption, common in his time, that Pluto was the size of Earth and had therefore scattered these bodies out toward the Oort cloud or out of the solar system. Were Kuiper's hypothesis correct, there would not be a Kuiper belt today. The hypothesis took many other forms in the following decades. In 1962, physicist Al G. W. 
Cameron postulated the existence of a tremendous mass of small material on the outskirts of the solar system. In 1964, Fred Whipple, who popularized the famous dirty snowball hypothesis for cometary structure, thought that a comet belt might be massive enough to cause the purported discrepancies in the orbit of Uranus that had sparked the search for Planet X, or, at the very least, massive enough to affect the orbits of known comets. Observation ruled out this hypothesis. In 1977, Charles Koval discovered 2060 Chiron, an icy planetoid with an orbit between Saturn and Uranus. He used a blink comparator, the same device that had allowed Clyde Tombaugh to discover Pluto nearly 50 years before. In 1992, another object, 5145 Pholus, was discovered in a similar orbit. Today, an entire population of comet-like bodies, called the centaurs, is known to exist in the region between Jupiter and Neptune. The centaurs' orbits are unstable and have dynamical lifetimes of a few million years. From the time of Chiron's discovery in 1977, astronomers have speculated that the centaurs therefore must be frequently replenished by some outer reservoir. Further evidence for the existence of the Kuiper belt later emerged from the study of comets. That comets have finite lifespans has been known for some time. As they approach the Sun, its heat causes their volatile surfaces to sublimate into space, gradually dispersing them. In order for comets to continue to be visible over the age of the solar system, they must be replenished frequently. One such area of replenishment is the Oort cloud, a spherical swarm of comets extending beyond 50,000 astronomical units from the Sun first hypothesized by Dutch astronomer Jan Oort in 1950. The Oort cloud is thought to be the point of origin of long period comets, which are those, like Hale Bopp, with orbits lasting thousands of years. There is another comet population, known as short period or periodic comets, consisting of those comets that, like Halley's Comet, have orbital periods of less than 200 years. By the 1970s, the rate at which short period comets were being discovered was becoming increasingly inconsistent with their having emerged solely from the Oort cloud. For an Oort cloud object to become a short-period comet, it would first have to be captured by the giant planets. In a paper published in Monthly Notices of the Royal Astronomical Society in 1980, Uruguayan astronomer Julio Fernandez stated that for every short-period comet to be sent into the inner solar system from the Oort cloud, 600 would have to be ejected into interstellar space. He speculated that a comet belt from between 35 and 50 astronomical units would be required to account for the observed number of comets. Following up on Fernandez's work, in 1988 the Canadian team of Martin Duncan, Tom Quinn and Scott Tremaine ran a number of computer simulations to determine if all observed comets could have arrived from the Oort cloud. They found that the Oort cloud could not account for all short-period comets, particularly as short-period comets are clustered near the plane of the solar system, whereas Oort cloud comets tend to arrive from any point in the sky. With a belt, as Fernandez described it, added to the formulations, the simulations matched observations. Reportedly because the words Kuiper and Comet Belt appeared in the opening sentence of Fernandez's paper, Tremaine named this hypothetical region the Kuiper Belt Topic. Discovery In 1987, astronomer David Jewitt, then at MIT, became increasingly puzzled by the apparent emptiness of the outer solar system. He encouraged then-graduate student Jane Liu to aid him in his endeavor to locate another object beyond Pluto's orbit, because, as he told her, if we don't, nobody will. Using telescopes at the Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona and the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile, Jewitt and Liu conducted their search in much the same way as Clyde Tombaugh and Charles Koval had, with a blink comparator. Initially, examination of each pair of plates took about eight hours, but the process was sped up with the arrival of electronic charge-coupled devices or CCDs, which, though their field of view was narrower, were not only more efficient at collecting light they retained 90% of the light that hit them, rather than the 10% achieved by photographs but allowed the blinking process to be done virtually, on a computer screen. Today, CCDs form the basis for most astronomical detectors. In 1988, Jewitt moved to the Institute of Astronomy at the University of Hawaii. Liu later joined him to work at the University of Hawaii's 2.24 meters telescope at Mauna Kea. 
Eventually, the field of view for CCDs had increased to 1024 by 1024 pixels, which allowed searches to be conducted far more rapidly. Finally, after five years of searching, Jawit and Liu announced on August 30, 1992 the "...discovery of the candidate Kuiper belt object", 15,760 Albion. Six months later, they discovered a second object in the region, 181708-1993 FW. Studies conducted since the Trans-Neptunian region was first charted have shown that the region now called the Kuiper Belt is not the point of origin of short-period comets, but that they instead derive from a linked population called the scattered disk. The scattered disk was created when Neptune migrated outward into the Proto-Kuiper Belt, which at the time was much closer to the Sun, and left in its wake a population of dynamically stable objects that could never be affected by its orbit the Kuiper Belt proper, and a population whose perihelia are close enough that Neptune can still disturb them as it travels around the Sun the scattered disk. Because the scattered disk is dynamically active and the Kuiper belt relatively dynamically stable, the scattered disk is now seen as the most likely point of origin for periodic comets. Topic. Name Astronomers sometimes use the alternative name Edgeworth Kuiper belt to credit Edgeworth, and KBOs are occasionally referred to as ECOs. Brian G. Marsden claims that neither deserves true credit. Neither Edgeworth nor Kuiper wrote about anything remotely like what we are now seeing, but Fred Whipple did. David Jewitt comments, If anything, Fernandez most nearly deserves the credit for predicting the Kuiper belt. KBOs are sometimes called Cooperoids, a name suggested by Clyde Tombaugh. The term, Trans Neptunian object. TNO is recommended for objects in the belt by several scientific groups because the term is less controversial than all others. It is not an exact synonym though, as TNOs include all objects orbiting the Sun past the orbit of Neptune, not just those in the Kuiper belt. Topic. Structure At its fullest extent but excluding the scattered disk, including its outlying regions, the Kuiper belt stretches from roughly 30 to 55 astronomical units. The main body of the belt is generally accepted to extend from the 2 to 3 mean motion resonance see below at 39.5 astronomical units to the 1 to 2 resonance at roughly 48 astronomical units. The Kuiper belt is quite thick, with the main concentration extending as much as 10 degrees outside the ecliptic plane and a more diffuse distribution of objects extending several times farther. Overall it more resembles a torus or donut than a belt. Its mean position is inclined to the ecliptic by 1.86 degrees. The presence of Neptune has a profound effect on the Kuiper belt's structure due to orbital resonances. Over a timescale comparable to the age of the solar system, Neptune's gravity destabilizes the orbits of any objects that happen to lie in certain regions, and either sends them into the inner solar system or out into the scattered disk or interstellar space. This causes the Kuiper belt to have pronounced gaps in its current layout, similar to the Kirkwood gaps in the asteroid belt. In the region between 40 and 42 astronomical units, for instance, no objects can retain a stable orbit over such times, and any observed in that region must have migrated there relatively recently. Topic: <laughs> Classical Belt. Between the 2 to 3 and 1 to 2 resonances with Neptune at approximately 42 to 48 astronomical units, the gravitational interactions with Neptune occur over an extended time scale and objects can exist with their orbits essentially unaltered. This region is known as the classical Kuiper belt and its members comprise roughly two-thirds of KBOs observed to date. Because the first modern KBO discovered Albion, but long called 15760-1992 QB1, is considered the prototype of this group. Classical KBOs are often referred to as Cubuenos. QB1 OS. The guidelines established by the IAU demand that classical KBOs be given names of mythological beings associated with creation. The classical Kuiper belt appears to be a composite of two separate populations. The first, known as the dynamically cold population, has orbits much like the planets, nearly circular, with an orbital eccentricity of less than 0.1, and with relatively low inclinations up to about 10 degrees they lie close to the plane of the solar system rather than at an angle. 
The cold population also contain a concentration of objects, referred to as the kernel, with semi-major axes at 44 to 44.5 AU. The second, the dynamically hot population, has orbits much more inclined to the ecliptic, by up to 30 degrees. The two populations have been named this way not because of any major difference in temperature, but from analogy to particles in a gas, which increase their relative velocity as they become heated up. Not only are the two populations in different orbits, the cold population also differs in color and albedo, being redder and brighter, has a larger fraction of binary objects, has a different size distribution, and lacks very large objects. The difference in colors may be a reflection of different compositions, which suggests they formed in different regions. The hot population is proposed to have formed near Neptune's original orbit and to have been scattered out during the migration of the giant planets. The cold population, on the other hand, has been proposed to have formed more or less in its current position because the loose binaries would be unlikely to survive encounters with Neptune. Although the NICE model appears to be able to at least partially explain a compositional difference, it has also been suggested the color difference may reflect differences in surface evolution. Topic. Resonances When an object's orbital period is an exact ratio of Neptune's a situation called a mean motion resonance, then it can become locked in a synchronized motion with Neptune and avoid being perturbed away if their relative alignments are appropriate. If, for instance, an object orbits the Sun twice for every three Neptune orbits, and if it reaches perihelion with Neptune a quarter of an orbit away from it, then whenever it returns to perihelion, Neptune will always be in about the same relative position as it began, because it will have completed one and a half orbits in the same time. This is known as the 2 to 3 or 3 to 2 resonance, and it corresponds to a characteristic semi-major axis of about 39.4 astronomical units. This 2-3 resonance is populated by about 200 known objects, including Pluto together with its moons. In recognition of this, the members of this family are known as platinos. Many platinos, including Pluto, have orbits that cross that of Neptune, though their resonance means they can never collide. Platinos have high orbital eccentricities, suggesting that they are not native to their current positions but were instead thrown haphazardly into their orbits by the migrating Neptune. IAU guidelines dictate that all platinos must, like Pluto, be named for underworld deities. The 1-2 resonance whose objects complete half an orbit for each of Neptune's corresponds to semi-major axes of approximately 47.7 astronomical units, and is sparsely populated. Its residents are sometimes referred to as twatinos. Other resonances also exist at 3-4, 3-5, 4-7 and 2-5. Neptune has a number of Trojan objects, which occupy its Lagrangian points, gravitationally stable regions leading and trailing it in its orbit. Neptune Trojans are in a 1 to 1 mean motion resonance with Neptune and often have very stable orbits. Additionally, there is a relative absence of objects with semi major axes below 39 astronomical units that cannot apparently be explained by the present resonances. The currently accepted hypothesis for the cause of this is that as Neptune migrated outward, unstable orbital resonances moved gradually through this region, and thus any objects within it were swept up, or gravitationally ejected from it. Topic. Kuiper cliff The 1-2 resonance, location of the Twitinos at 47.8 AU, appears to be an edge beyond which few objects are known. It is not clear whether it is actually the outer edge of the classical belt or just the beginning of a broad gap. Objects have been detected at the 2-5 resonance at roughly 55 astronomical units, well outside the classical belt. Predictions of a large number of bodies in classical orbits between these resonances have not been verified through observation, based on estimations of the primordial mass required to form Uranus and Neptune, as well as bodies as large as Pluto. See section mass and size distribution. Earlier models of the Kuiper belt had suggested that the number of large objects would increase by a factor of two beyond 50 astronomical units, so this sudden drastic falloff, known as the Kuiper Cliff, was unexpected, and to date its cause is unknown. In 2003, Bernstein, Trilling, et al., found evidence that the rapid decline in objects of 100 km or more in radius beyond 50 AU is real, and not due to observational bias. 
Possible explanations include that material at that distance was too scarce or too scattered to accrete into large objects, or that subsequent processes removed or destroyed those that did. Patrick Lykaka of Kobe University claimed that the gravitational attraction of an unseen large planetary object, perhaps the size of Earth or Mars, might be responsible. Origin The precise origins of the Kuiper belt and its complex structure are still unclear, and astronomers are awaiting the completion of several wide-field survey telescopes such as PAN-STARRS and the future LSST, which should reveal many currently unknown KBOs. These surveys will provide data that will help determine answers to these questions. The Kuiper belt is thought to consist of planetesimals, fragments from the original protoplanetary disk around the Sun that failed to fully coalesce into planets and instead formed into smaller bodies, the largest less than 3,000 km in diameter. Studies of the crater counts on Pluto and Charon revealed a scarcity of small craters suggesting that such objects formed directly as sizable objects in the range of tens of kilometers in diameter rather than being accreted from much smaller, roughly kilometer-scale bodies. Hypothetical mechanisms for the formation of these larger bodies include the gravitational collapse of clouds of pebbles concentrated between eddies in a turbulent protoplanetary disk or in streaming instabilities. These collapsing clouds may fragment, forming binaries. Modern computer simulations show the Kuiper belt to have been strongly influenced by Jupiter and Neptune, and also suggest that neither Uranus nor Neptune could have formed in their present positions, because too little primordial matter existed at that range to produce objects of such high mass. Instead, these planets are estimated to have formed closer to Jupiter. Scattering of planetesimals early in the solar system's history would have led to migration of the orbits of the giant planets, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune drifted outwards, whereas Jupiter drifted inwards. Eventually, the orbits shifted to the point where Jupiter and Saturn reached an exact 1-2 resonance. Jupiter orbited the Sun twice for every one Saturn orbit. The gravitational repercussions of such a resonance ultimately destabilized the orbits of Uranus and Neptune, causing them to be scattered outward onto high eccentricity orbits that crossed the primordial planetesimal disk. While Neptune's orbit was highly eccentric, its mean motion resonances overlapped and the orbits of the planetesimals evolved chaotically, allowing planetesimals to wander outward as far as Neptune's 1-2 resonance to form a dynamically cold belt of low-inclination objects. Later, after its eccentricity decreased, Neptune's orbit expanded outward toward its current position. Many planetesimals were captured into and remain in resonances during this migration, others evolved onto higher inclination and lower eccentricity orbits and escaped from the resonances onto stable orbits. Many more planetesimals were scattered inward, with small fractions being captured as Jupiter trojans, as irregular satellites orbiting the giant planets, and as outer belt asteroids. The remainder were scattered outward again by Jupiter and in most cases ejected from the solar system reducing the primordial Kuiper belt population by 99% or more. The original version of the currently most popular model, the Nice model, reproduces many characteristics of the Kuiper belt such as the cold and hot populations, resonant objects, and a scattered disk, but it still fails to account for some of the characteristics of their distributions. The model predicts a higher average eccentricity in classical KBO orbits than is observed 0.10 to 0.13 versus 0.07 and its predicted inclination distribution contains too few high inclination objects. In addition, the frequency of binary objects in the cold belt, many of which are far apart and loosely bound, also poses a problem for the model. These are predicted to have been separated during encounters with Neptune, leading some to propose that the cold disk formed at its current location, representing the only truly local population of small bodies in the solar system. A recent modification of the NICE model has the solar system begin with five giant planets, including an additional ice giant, in a chain of mean motion resonances. About 400 million years after the formation of the solar system, the resonance chain is broken. Instead of being scattered into the disk, the ice giants first migrate outward several O. This divergent migration eventually leads to a resonance crossing, destabilizing the orbits of the planets. The extra ice giant encounters Saturn and is scattered inward onto a Jupiter-crossing orbit and after a series of encounters is ejected from the solar system. 
The remaining planets then continue their migration until the planetesimal disk is nearly depleted with small fractions remaining in various locations. As in the original NICE model, objects are captured into resonances with Neptune during its outward migration. Some remain in the resonances, others evolve onto higher inclination, lower eccentricity orbits, and are released onto stable orbits forming the dynamically hot classical belt. The hot belt's inclination distribution can be reproduced if Neptune migrated from 24 AU to 30 AU on a 30 MYR timescale. When Neptune migrates to 28 AU, it has a gravitational encounter with the extra ice giant. Objects captured from the cold belt into the 1 to 2 mean motion resonance with Neptune are left behind as a local concentration at 44 astronomical units when this encounter causes Neptune's semi-major axis to jump outward. The objects deposited in the cold belt include some loosely bound blue binaries originating from closer than the cold belt's current location. If Neptune's eccentricity remains small during this encounter, the chaotic evolution of orbits of the original NICE model is avoided and a primordial cold belt is preserved. In the later phases of Neptune's migration, a slow sweeping of mean motion resonances removes the higher eccentricity objects from the cold belt, truncating its eccentricity distribution. Topic. Composition Being distant from the Sun and major planets, Kuiper belt objects are thought to be relatively unaffected by the processes that have shaped and altered other solar system objects, thus, determining their composition would provide substantial information on the makeup of the earliest solar system. Due to their small size and extreme distance from Earth, the chemical makeup of KBOs is very difficult to determine. The principal method by which astronomers determine the composition of a celestial object is spectroscopy. When an object's light is broken into its component colors, an image akin to a rainbow is formed. This image is called a spectrum. Different substances absorb light at different wavelengths, and when the spectrum for a specific object is unraveled, dark lines, called absorption lines appear where the substances within it have absorbed that particular wavelength of light. Every element or compound has its own unique spectroscopic signature, and by reading an object's full spectral fingerprint, Astronomers can determine its composition. Analysis indicates that Kuiper belt objects are composed of a mixture of rock and a variety of ices such as water, methane, and ammonia. The temperature of the belt is only about 50 K, so many compounds that would be gaseous closer to the Sun remain solid. The densities and rock ice fractions are known for only a small number of objects for which the diameters and the masses have been determined. The diameter can be determined by imaging with a high-resolution telescope such as the Hubble Space Telescope, by the timing of an occultation when an object passes in front of a star or, most commonly, by using the albedo of an object calculated from its infrared emissions. The masses are determined using the semi-major axes and periods of satellites, which are therefore known only for a few binary objects. The densities range from less than 0.4 to 2.6 grams per cc. The least dense objects are thought to be largely composed of ice and have significant porosity. The densest objects are likely composed of rock with a thin crust of ice. There is a trend of low densities for small objects and high densities for the largest objects. One possible explanation for this trend is that ice was lost from the surface layers when differentiated objects collided to form the largest objects. Initially, detailed analysis of KBOs was impossible, and so astronomers were only able to determine the most basic facts about their makeup, primarily their color. These first data showed a broad range of colors among KBOs, ranging from neutral gray to deep red. This suggested that their surfaces were composed of a wide range of compounds, from dirty ices to hydrocarbons. This diversity was startling, as astronomers had expected KBOs to be uniformly dark, having lost most of the volatile ices from their surfaces to the effects of cosmic rays. Various solutions were suggested for this discrepancy, including resurfacing by impacts or outgassing. Jewitt and Lu's spectral analysis of the known Kuiper belt objects in 2001 found that the variation in color was too extreme to be easily explained by random impacts. The radiation from the Sun is thought to have chemically altered methane on the surface of KBOs, producing products such as tholines. 
Makemake has been shown to possess a number of hydrocarbons derived from the radiation processing of methane, including ethane, ethylene and acetylene. Although to date most KBOs still appear spectrally featureless due to their faintness, there have been a number of successes in determining their composition. In 1996, Robert H. Brown et al. acquired spectroscopic data on the KBO 1993 SC, which revealed that its surface composition is markedly similar to that of Pluto, as well as Neptune's moon Triton, with large amounts of methane ice. For the smaller objects, only colors and in some cases the albedos have been determined. These objects largely fall into two classes, gray with low albedos, or very red with higher albedos. The difference in colors and albedos is hypothesized to be due to the retention or the loss of hydrogen sulfide H2S on the surface of these objects, with the surfaces of those that formed far enough from the sun to retain H2S being reddened due to irradiation. The largest KBOs, such as Pluto and Quaor, have surfaces rich in volatile compounds such as methane, nitrogen, and carbon monoxide. The presence of these molecules is likely due to their moderate vapor pressure in the 30 to 50 K temperature range of the Kuiper belt. This allows them to occasionally boil off their surfaces and then fall again as snow, whereas compounds with higher boiling points would remain solid. The relative abundances of these three compounds in the largest KBOs is directly related to their surface gravity and ambient temperature, which determines which they can retain. Water ice has been detected in several KBOs, including members of the Haumea family such as 1996 TO66, mid-sized objects such as 38,628 Hoya and 20,000 Varuna, and also on some small objects. The presence of crystalline ice on large and mid-sized objects, including 50,000 Quaor where ammonia hydrate has also been detected, may indicate past tectonic activity aided by melting point lowering due to the presence of ammonia. Topic. Mass and size distribution Despite its vast extent, the collective mass of the Kuiper belt is relatively low. The total mass is estimated to range between 1 25th and 1 10th the mass of the Earth. Conversely, models of the solar system's formation predict a collective mass for the Kuiper belt of 30 Earth masses. This missing greater than 99% of the mass can hardly be dismissed, because it is required for the accretion of any KBOs larger than 100 km miles in diameter. If the Kuiper belt had always had its current low density, these large objects simply could not have formed by the collision and mergers of smaller planetesimals. Moreover, the eccentricity and inclination of current orbits makes the encounters quite violent, resulting in destruction rather than accretion. It appears that either the current residents of the Kuiper belt have been created closer to the Sun, or some mechanism dispersed the original mass. Neptune's current influence is too weak to explain such a massive vacuuming, though the NICE model proposes that it could have been the cause of mass removal in the past. Although the question remains open, the conjectures vary from a passing star scenario to grinding of smaller objects, via collisions, into dust small enough to be affected by solar radiation. The extent of mass loss by collisional grinding is limited by the presence of loosely bound binaries in the cold disk, which are likely to be disrupted in collisions. Bright objects are rare compared with the dominant dim population, as expected from accretion models of origin, given that only some objects of a given size would have grown further. This relationship between n, d, the number of objects of diameter greater than d, and d, referred to as brightness slope, has been confirmed by observations. The slope is inversely proportional to some power of the diameter d, dn d d d minus q display style frac dn d d propto d caret q, where the current measures give q equals 4 plus or minus 0.5. This implies, assuming q is not 1, that n d 1 minus q plus a constant display style n propto d caret 1 q plus text a constant. The constant may be non-zero only if the power law doesn't apply at high values of d less formally, if q is 4, for example, there are 8 equals 23 times more objects in the 100 to 200 km range than in the 200 to 400 km range, and for every object with a diameter between 1000 and 1010 km there should be around 1000 equals 103 objects with diameter of 100 to 101 km. If q was 1 or less, the law would imply an infinite number and mass of large objects in the Kuiper belt. If one slope parameter q is in effect greater at large diameters and lesser at small diameters. 
It seems that Pluto is somewhat unexpectedly large, having several percent of the total mass of the Kuiper belt. It is not expected that anything larger than Pluto exists in the Kuiper belt, and in fact most of the brightest largest objects at inclinations less than 5 degrees have probably been found. For most TNOs, only the absolute magnitude is actually known. The size is inferred assuming a given albedo, not a safe assumption for larger objects. Recent research has revealed that the size distributions of the hot classical and cold classical objects have differing slopes. The slope for the hot objects is Q topic 5.3 at large diameters and Q 2.0 at small diameters with the change in slope at 110 km. The slope for the cold objects is Q topic 8.2 at large diameters and Q 2.9 at small diameters with a change in slope at 140 km. The size distributions of the scattering objects, the Platinos, and the Neptune Trojans have slopes similar to the other dynamically hot populations, but may instead have a divot, a sharp decrease in the number of objects below a specific size. This divot is hypothesized to be due to either the collisional evolution of the population, or to be due to the population having formed with no objects below this size, with the smaller objects being fragments of the original objects. As of December 2009, the smallest Kuiper belt object detected is 980 meters across. It is too dim magnitude 35 to be seen by Hubble directly, but it was detected by Hubble's star tracking system when it occulted a star. Topic. Scattered objects The scattered disk is a sparsely populated region, overlapping with the Kuiper belt but extending to beyond 100 astronomical units. Scattered disk objects SDOs have very elliptical orbits, often also very inclined to the ecliptic. Most models of solar system formation show both KBOs and SDOs first forming in a primordial belt, with later gravitational interactions, particularly with Neptune, sending the objects outward, some into stable orbits the KBOs, and some into unstable orbits, the scattered disk. Due to its unstable nature, the scattered disk is suspected to be the point of origin of many of the solar system's short-period comets. Their dynamic orbits occasionally force them into the inner solar system, first becoming centaurs, and then short-period comets, according to the Minor Planet Center, which officially catalogues all trans-Neptunian objects. A KBO, strictly speaking, is any object that orbits exclusively within the defined Kuiper belt region regardless of origin or composition. Objects found outside the belt are classed as scattered objects. In some scientific circles the term, Kuiper belt object has become synonymous with any icy minor planet native to the outer solar system assumed to have been part of that initial class, even if its orbit during the bulk of solar system history has been beyond the Kuiper belt e.g. in the scattered disk region. They often describe scattered disk objects as scattered Kuiper belt objects. Eris, which is known to be more massive than Pluto, is often referred to as a KBO, but is technically an SDO. A consensus among astronomers as to the precise definition of the Kuiper belt has yet to be reached, and this issue remains unresolved. The centaurs, which are not normally considered part of the Kuiper belt, are also thought to be scattered objects, the only difference being that they were scattered inward, rather than outward. The minor planet center groups the centaurs and the SDOs together as scattered objects. Topic. Triton. During its period of migration, Neptune is thought to have captured a large KBO, Triton, which is the only large moon in the solar system with a retrograde orbit it orbits opposite to Neptune's rotation. This suggests that, unlike the large moons of Jupiter, Saturn and Uranus, which are thought to have coalesced from rotating disks of material around their young parent planets, Triton was a fully formed body that was captured from surrounding space. Gravitational capture of an object is not easy, it requires some mechanism to slow down the object enough to be caught by the larger object's gravity. A possible explanation is that Triton was part of a binary when it encountered Neptune. Many KBOs are members of binaries. See below, ejection of the other member of the binary by Neptune could then explain Triton's capture. Triton is only 14% larger than Pluto, and spectral analysis of both worlds shows that their surfaces are largely composed of similar materials, such as methane and carbon monoxide. All this points to the conclusion that Triton was once a KBO that was captured by Neptune during its outward migration. <laughs> <laughs> Largest KBOs 
Since 2000, a number of KBOs with diameters of between 500 and 1,500 kilometers (932 miles), more than half that of Pluto, diameter 2,370 kilometers, have been discovered. 50,000 Quaor, a classical KBO discovered in 2002, is over 1,200 kilometers across. Makemake and Haumea, both announced on July 29, 2005, are larger still. Other objects, such as 28,978 Ixion discovered in 2001 and 20,000 Varuna discovered in 2000, measure roughly 500 kilometers (311 miles) across. Topic: <laughs> Pluto. The discovery of these large KBOs in orbits similar to Pluto's led many to conclude that, aside from its relative size, Pluto was not particularly different from other members of the Kuiper belt. Not only are these objects similar to Pluto in size, but many also have satellites, and are of similar composition methane and carbon monoxide have been found both on Pluto and on the largest KBOs. Thus, just as Ceres was considered a planet before the discovery of its fellow asteroids, some began to suggest that Pluto might also be reclassified. The issue was brought to a head by the discovery of Eris, an object in the scattered disk far beyond the Kuiper belt, that is now known to be 27% more massive than Pluto. Eris was originally thought to be larger than Pluto by volume, but the New Horizons mission found this not to be the case. In response, the International Astronomical Union (IAU) was forced to define what a planet is for the first time, and in so doing included in their definition that a planet must have cleared the neighborhood around its orbit. As Pluto shares its orbit with many other sizable objects, it was deemed not to have cleared its orbit, and was thus reclassified from a planet to a dwarf planet, making it a member of the Kuiper belt. Although Pluto is currently the largest known KBO, there is at least one known larger object currently outside the Kuiper belt that probably originated in it, Neptune's moon Triton which, as explained above, is probably a captured KBO. As of 2008, only five objects in the solar system Ceres, Eris, and the KBOs Pluto, Makemake and Haumea are listed as dwarf planets by the IAU. 90,482 Orcus, 28,978 Ixion and many other Kuiper belt objects are large enough to be in hydrostatic equilibrium, most of them will probably qualify when more is known about them. Satellites. The six largest TNOs Eris, Pluto, 2007 OR10, Makemake, Haumea and Quaor are all known to have satellites, and two have more than one. A higher percentage of the larger KBOs have satellites than the smaller objects in the Kuiper belt, suggesting that a different formation mechanism was responsible. There are also a high number of binaries two objects close enough in mass to be orbiting each other in the Kuiper belt. The most notable example is the pluto charon binary, but it is estimated that around 11% of KBOs exist in binaries. <inaudible> Exploration On January 19, 2006, the first spacecraft to explore the Kuiper Belt, New Horizons, was launched, which flew by Pluto on July 14, 2015. Beyond the Pluto flyby, the mission's goal was to locate and investigate other, farther objects in the Kuiper belt. On October 15, 2014, it was revealed that Hubble had uncovered three potential targets, provisionally designated PT 1, Potential Target 1, PT 2, and PT 3 by the New Horizons team. The object's diameters were estimated to be in the 30 to 55 km range, too small to be seen by ground telescopes, at distances from the Sun of 43 to 44 astronomical units, which would put the encounters in the 2018-2019 period. The initial estimated probabilities that these objects were reachable within New Horizons fuel budget were 100%, 7%, and 97%, respectively. All were members of the cold low inclination, low eccentricity classical Kuiper belt, and thus very different from Pluto. PT-1 given the temporary designation 1110113Y on the HST website, the most favorably situated object, was magnitude 26.8, 30 to 45 km in diameter, and will be encountered around January 2019. 
Once sufficient orbital information was provided, the Minor Planet Center gave official designations to the three target KBOs, 2014 MU69 PT1, 2014 OS393 PT2, and 2014 PN70 PT3. By the fall of 2014, a possible fourth target, 2014 MT69, had been eliminated by follow-up observations. PT2 was out of the running before the Pluto flyby. On August 26, 2015, the first target, 2014 MU69, was chosen. Course adjustment took place in late October and early November 2015, leading to a flyby in January 2019. On July 1, 2016, NASA approved additional funding for New Horizons to visit the object. On December 2, 2015, New Horizons detected 1994 JR1 from 270 million kilometers, 170 times 10 to the 6 miles away, and the photographs show the shape of the object and one or two details. No follow-up missions for New Horizons are planned, though at least two concepts for missions that would return to orbit or land on Pluto have been studied. Beyond Pluto, there exist many large KBOs that cannot be visited with New Horizons, such as the dwarf planets Makemake and Haumea. New missions would be tasked to explore and study these objects in detail. Thales Alenia Space has studied the logistics of an orbiter mission to Haumea, a high-priority scientific target due to its status as the parent body of a collisional family that includes several other TNOs, as well as Haumea's ring and two moons. The lead author, Joel Ponce, has advocated for new technology that would allow spacecraft to reach and orbit KBOs in 10 to 20 years or less. New Horizons principal investigator Alan Stern has informally suggested missions that would fly by the planets Uranus or Neptune before visiting new KBO targets, thus furthering the exploration of the Kuiper Belt while also visiting these ice giant planets for the first time since the Voyager 2 flybys in the 1980s. Quaor would make a particularly attractive flyby target for a probe tasked with exploring the interstellar medium, as it currently lies near the heliospheric nose. Pontus Brandt at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory and his colleagues have studied a probe that would fly by Quaor in the 2030s before continuing to the interstellar medium through the heliospheric nose. Quaor is also an attractive target due to a likely disappearing methane atmosphere and cyrovolcanism. The mission studied by Brandt and his colleagues would launch using SLS and achieve 30 km per second using a Jupiter flyby. Alternatively, for an orbiter mission, a study published in 2012 concluded that Ixion and Hoya are among the most feasible targets. For instance, the authors calculated that an orbiter mission could reach Ixion after 17 years cruise time if launched in 2039. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Extrasolar Kuiper belts. By 2006, astronomers had resolved dust disks thought to be Kuiper belt-like structures around nine stars other than the Sun. They appear to fall into two categories, wide belts, with radii of over 50 astronomical units, and narrow belts tentatively like that of the solar system with radii of between 20 and 30 astronomical units and relatively sharp boundaries. Beyond this, 15-20% of solar-type stars have an observed infrared excess that is suggestive of massive Kuiper belt-like structures. Most known debris disks around other stars are fairly young, but the two images on the right, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in January 2006, are old enough roughly 300 million years to have settled into stable configurations. The left image is a top view of a wide belt, and the right image is an edge view of a narrow belt. Computer simulations of dust in the Kuiper belt suggest that when it was younger, it may have resembled the narrow rings seen around younger stars. Topic. See also List of possible dwarf planets List of trans-Neptunian objects Asteroid belt Another ring of objects from about 2 to 3 astronomical units Topic. Notes Topic. References Topic. Bibliography Randall, Lisa 2015. Dark Matter and the Dinosaurs. New York, Echo, HarperCollins Publishers. ISBN 978-0-06-232847-2.
Topic: External links. Dave Jewitt's page at UCLA. The belt's name. List of short period comets by family. Kuiper Belt Profile by NASA's Solar System Exploration The Kuiper Belt Electronic Newsletter W.M. Robert Johnston's TNO page Minor Planet Center, plot of the Outer Solar System, illustrating Kuiper Gap Website of the International Astronomical Union debating the status of TNOs 26th General Assembly 2006 Nature.com article, diagram displaying inner solar system, Kuiper belt, and Oort cloud, taken from Alan Stern, S. 2003. The evolution of comets in the Oort cloud and Kuiper belt. Nature. 424 6949, 639-42. doi, 10.1038, Nature 01725. PMID 12904784. Space.com, Discovery Hints at a Quadrillion Space Rocks Beyond Neptune Sarah Ghadarzi, August 15, 2006 6.13 a.m. Eastern Time The Outer Solar System Astronomy Cast Episode No. 64, includes full transcript. The Kuiper Belt at 365 Days of Astronomy. Org Nine Planets webpage on the Edgeworth Kuiper Belt and Oort Cloud List of TNOS.